I'm Sarah Kenzier, the author of the bestsellers The View from Flyover Country and Hiding in Plain Sight, and of the upcoming book They Knew, out this September. I am Andrea Chalupa, a journalist and filmmaker, and the writer and producer of the journalistic thriller Mr. Jones, about Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine. And if you want to host a screening of Mr. Jones wherever you live to help raise awareness of the ongoing genocidal war by Putin against Ukrainians, then reach out to the wonderful folks at West End Films in London, and they can get you connected to your local distributor who could help you set up a screening wherever you live. It could be a fundraiser screening or a raise awareness screening. The email you want for that is info at westendfilms.com, info at westendfilms.com. And this is Gaslit Nation, a podcast covering corruption in the United States and rising autocracy around the world. This week's bonus episode for our subscribers at the Truth Time level and higher on Patreon, which it will be uh, a live, a live Q and A with our listeners, our subscribers at the Democracy Defender level and higher. We do a regular Q and A, the first time ever. We're going to have a live Q and A. This afternoon, we've been promoting it on the show for several weeks now. Um, if you are, are missing this one, there's going to be another one coming up over the summer you can go to. Um, so, but if you want to see the, if you want the audio recording from that, sign up at the truth tell level or higher. Everybody at the democracy defender level and higher will get the full video recording of that. Sarah and I are going to take showers for this. It's going to be a big deal. <laughs> so thank you everyone for supporting the show. Yes. All right. Uh, So today we have a very important interview uh, coming up in this episode, which Andrea will tell you about later. Um, But, you know, first I want to return to our coverage of the United States and the assault on democracy here. Um, You know, we spent the last, I don't know, five or six episodes uh, focusing almost exclusively on Ukraine and Russia. Um, And it's essential to bring home the fact that many of the same individuals uh, are implicated in Putin's war and in the Trump crime coal and its extended mafia networks assault on US democracy. And as we've noted many times, uh, Merrick Garland's DOJ Uh, has not risen to the task and has, in fact, uh, enabled the cover-up and the lack of accountability for the crimes committed by this mafia network, not just during Trump's tenure, but for decades on end. And so uh, I'm going to just bring you some new insights on that today. It has been 14 months since the Capitol attack, and none of the criminal elites who orchestrated it have been brought to justice. With the exception of the arrests of Oath Keepers and Proud Boys, who are the middlemen of the attack, not the criminal elites orchestrating it, the DOJ has focused excessively on the random people recruited by criminal elite networks to show up on January 6th. Meanwhile, Bannon, Flynn, Stone, and other high-level, actively dangerous operatives run free. Let's get real. If you are part of the cover-up, you are part of the crime. That is the story of Merrick Garland's DOJ. They are an accomplice in the attack on American democracy. It's important to remember that this is the story of Merrick Garland's DOJ, because right now, the January 6th committee is about to rewrite that story. You might be saying to yourself, wait, the January 6th committee and the DOJ are separate entities. How could one rewrite the story of the other? The answer is that last week, the January 6th committee announced that it is consulting Jamie Gorelick, the deeply corrupt mentor of Merrick Garland, who we've covered on this show many times, to, and this is a quote from the Washington Post, write its report about the attack on the Capitol, hoping to build a narrative thriller that compels audiences. I do not disagree with the goal of making the report compelling. But I do disagree with the January 6th committee hiring a corrupt lawyer deeply tied to both Garland and the Trump crime cult to oversee it, especially when this lawyer has a history of propaganda. We've discussed Jamie Gorelick on Gaslit Nation many times, but here is the short version. 
She is a lifelong friend and mentor to Merrick Garland, and she is a protege of Alan Dershowitz. She was Garland's boss at the Clinton DOJ in the 1990s. Since quitting that job, she has moved through American life like the Forrest Gump of corruption. Among the things Greylick has done, and this is the short version, please consult gaslitnationpod.com uh, for the full version. She wrote the memo that created a wall between intelligence agencies in the 1990s and helped make 9-11 possible, and then refused to testify to the 9-11 committee about that. She profited from a massive student loan corruption scheme while representing Fannie Mae, lobbied for fossil fuel companies after they did oil spills, lobbied for the worst of big tech, lobbied for police officers who killed innocent black men, volunteered in 2017 to be Jared and Ivanka's lawyer, thus enabling them to skirt legal requirements and infiltrate the White House. Gorelick did the same for Rex Tillerson. Rex Tillerson, who received an Order of Friendship Medal from Putin in 2013 before becoming Trump's Secretary of State. Gorelick was Tillerson's lawyer for that, to make sure he got in there, despite his dangerous ties to the Kremlin. This is who Jamie Gorelick is. Merrick Garland's lifelong friend and advisor is entrenched in Trump's criminal network. When the January 6th committee turns to Jared and Ivanka's lawyer to tell the story of January 6th, in which Ivanka was so involved, she was called to testify by the January 6th committee, we have a massive problem. I was researching Gorelick to figure out why the committee would select her. And in the process, I learned even more disturbing information about Merrick Garland and his recurring role, almost always with Gorelick, in shady political alliances involving U.S. national security. In a previous episode called Merrick Garland, Both Sides the Coup, I documented how there is an elaborate propaganda operation surrounding Garland for over half a decade. The tactics of this include planting misleading articles in mainstream media outlets and spamming social media to make it look like Garland did things like catch Tim Timothy McVeigh or play a similar role in his prosecution. Uh, to be clear, Garland did neither. His role was minimal. He also did not catch the Unabomber. The Unabomber was turned in by his brother. Like These are all myths that if you're on Twitter at all, if you say the words Merrick Garland, someone will, will show up in your mentions spouting this, but it is nonsense. And it's, you know, debunked by such things as being alive in 1995. Like these are very basic pieces of information. So it's very disturbing that people keep lying about them in unison uh, en masse. Um, so anyway, check that episode uh, for more about that propaganda. What I didn't know when we aired that episode in January is that the original version of this narrative first appeared in 2010 when Merrick Garland was considered as a replacement for John Paul Stevens on the Supreme Court. And again, it, it reemerged in 2016 uh, when, of course, you know, he was nominated for the Supreme Court and um, Mitch McConnell uh, and his goon squad vetoed that. But anyway, like I've said, this is the same narrative over and over again, often almost the same article over and over again in different outlets. And I have now found the template. The 2010 article from the New York Times is called How Bombing Case Helped Shape Career of a Potential Justice. And it has the prerequisite quotes from Gorelick. Uh, she is in every single one of these articles. And insinuations that Garland was more involved in Oklahoma City than he actually was. Although, interestingly, this article ultimately admits he, he really didn't do very much different in this respect than the, the articles that came later. But it also has something new. It has a new character witness for Garland, a new quote from someone he's been close to. And that person is Joseph DiGenova. Who is Joseph DiGenova? He is a Trump crime cult and oligarch lawyer with a long, dark history in Republican politics. You may remember him from the 2020 attempted coup because he was part of the legal team that tried to turn over the election for Donald Trump. DiGenova is a close friend and associate of Rudy Giuliani and played a role in the Ukraine shakedown that led to Trump's first impeachment. In 2019, DiGenova and his wife, Victoria Tonsing, 
began representing Ukrainian oligarch Dmitry Fyotrash to help him avoid extradition to the U.S. under a federal indictment, while their partner Giuliani took over the operation to target Joe Biden in Ukraine. Fyotrash is a Kremlin lackey and a longtime partner of Paul Manafort, and Tonsing and DiGenova were the people who hired the now indicted Lev Parnas for the Ukraine operation as Giuliani picked off where the then imprisoned Manafort left off. DiGenovo was also part of the legal team that worked against Mueller when Mueller was investigating Trump in 2018. And so I can go on and on about this guy because DiGenovo's illicit activity and criminal ties date back to the Reagan era. In fact, he was up to some things in the 1980s. I don't even want to, I don't even want to say what they were, but it's bad. I'll just say this is a very dangerous man. And his wife is dangerous as well. So dangerous that the FBI raided her home in April 2021 over her involvement in the Ukraine dealings. This home is also ostensibly Dijanova's home because they're married, but the search warrant was in her name. In a May 2021 court filing, investigators disclosed that in late 2019, they acquired a search warrant for Tonsing's iCloud account and for that of Giuliani and for an email account belonging to her. And since then, what's happened to these folks, these anti-American actors, uh, these potentially treasonous criminals? Nothing. Now remember, this is a man close enough to Merrick Garland that the New York Times sought him out as a reference for Garland. And what did DiGenova have to say about Merrick Garland? He's a big fan. This is the quote, Judge Garland, this is uh, DiGenova talking, is a profoundly serious guy who really should be the kind of person you want to have on the Supreme Court, said Joseph E. DiGenova, a Republican and U.S. attorney in the Reagan administration. If Obama wants to get a fantastic judge on the court, he's got one ready to go in Merrick Garland. Merrick Garland, of course, did not get the job. It went to Elena Kagan. But notably, the attempt to install Merrick Garland in high office did not end there. Garland was initially considered as a replacement for Robert Mueller as FBI director in 2011, though Garland at the time expressed a lack of interest in the position. Gurelik was also considered for FBI head by the Obama administration. This is a terrifying prospect that was thankfully shot down at the time due to her extensive history of corruption, although that really wasn't much of an imposition for other, or maybe almost all, heads um, of the FBI. Anyway, to sum all this up, it is alarming that the official story of January 6th will be guided by a woman who has worked for people like Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner who are implicated in the January 6th attack. It is deeply troubling that Gurelik is serving as a bridge between the January 6th committee and the DOJ under Merrick Garland, and that both of them are tied to the Trump crime cult and its affiliates including, and especially, Alan Dershowitz, Jared Kushner, and Joseph DiGenova. This is a massive conflict of interest at best and extraordinarily dangerous at worst. When you ask why Garland is not prosecuting elites who committed obvious crimes, or why the January 6th committee lets crime cult members dodge subpoenas and has yet to hold hearings as they once promised they would, these alliances are part of the answer. Andrea, any thoughts? I think what you're saying and, and the war that Putin is carrying out in Ukraine, all of that points to the urgency of accountability and shining a light on corruption and all its many forms, shining a light especially on fascism and the proxies used by fascists to come to power, consolidate power, stay in power and further enrich themselves and escape accountability and further their political violence, all in order to stay in power. Um, so I think that's just the big connection between what you're laying out and what we're about to hear with this uh, interview with a civil society leader from Ukraine. It was a huge shock, obviously, when Putin went total war on Ukraine. Ukrainians themselves did not believe it. 
I did not believe it. It seemed like more saber rattling from Russia. But the reality is that Putin did it in large part because the West did nothing to stop him all these years. He invaded Georgia. No, no, let's start from the beginning. (laughs) There was all this reporting on how Putin and his FSB crime cult in the Kremlin orchestrated apartment bombings in Moscow, killing Russian people to come to power and justify a brutal war that leveled Chechnya, that destroyed Chechnya. So that was the first warning sign. We should have stopped him there. We should have isolated that guy there. We should have treated him like the terrorist he is then, but we didn't. And then he went on to invade Georgia. He went on to invade Ukraine. He went on to terrorize and commit massive atrocities in Syria, deliberately killing civilians in Syria, even though he's claiming to fight ISIS. No, he was going after hospitals. He was going after schools. He was going after all of the essential infrastructure to live life that we're now seeing him do now in Ukraine, the same playbook. And now he's doing total war against Ukraine. Oh, and let's also factor in how he tipped the vote in the very close Brexit vote. He uh, tipped the vote in the very close Trump vote, giving the Trump campaign all of this much needed help to win the 2016 election. And that was all documented in Robert Mueller's Russia report. And we saw out in the open how Trump himself and others were welcoming that help. And even the idiot sons have admitted how much Trump businesses depend on Russian oligarch money. So all of this is to, is to say is that without accountability, lives will be lost. Genocides will be committed. Millions of refugees will be created. So accountability is essential. And people that try to kick that can down the road are only making things worse, as we're now seeing in Ukraine. And that's a topic of conversation we're going to have for a very long time now because we have to. It's urgent. Um, so just to set up the conversation we're about to hear, I want to just give a quick uh, news update of what's going on. Russia still remains frozen in Ukraine, as we keep pointing out. The military is suffering under its own kleptocracy, its own dysfunction, having believed its own disinformation that they'd be welcomed with flowers. That's not happening. Um, and so it's pretty much frozen. And out of that frustration, Russians are openly committing war crimes in Ukraine, shooting civilians point blank, deliberately bombing civilians in major cities, putting a, a major city uh, in the southeast, Mariupol, what was a jewel, a jewel of a coastal city in a siege, starving the people to death. There's reports in Mariupol that survivors of that siege are currently shooting, hunting stray dogs to eat them. Stray dogs are eating bodies in the street. This is the kind of stuff that uh, was going on during the Holodomor, Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine. And it's now going on under Putin today. And we should have known that this would happen because for years now, Putin has brought back the cult of Stalin. And now look at what he's done to Russia. It's now back in Soviet times, the Great Terror. So with that, we had Alexei Navalny, the Russian opposition leader and the anti-corruption activist. He was just sentenced yet again in a Soviet trial, another one. This time he's getting nine years in prison, nine additional years on trumped up charges. Uh, He does have a link to the outside world and was able to share a message calling on people to join him wherever you are to support his work through the Anti-Corruption Foundation to bring down Putin and his fascist, unbelievably corrupt regime. Navalny calls on people to please join, please support the Anti-Corruption Foundation. We'll link to the info on how you can support that group in the show notes for this episode, which will be available as always in the Patreon link for this week's episode. Navalny's team, just to give you an idea of the, the brave an important work they do. Navalny's team recently uncovered that one of the most expensive yachts in the world, the Scheherazade, a $700 million mega yacht, likely belongs to, you guessed it, mass murderer and war crime enthusiast, Vladimir Putin. So if you care about that, if you care about bringing Putin to justice and sending up to him, go on to look up the Anti-Corruption Foundation. We'll link to it again in our show notes and you can support them there. Also out of Russia, you have um, Dmitry Muratov, who is the editor-in-chief of Novaya Gazeta, an independent newspaper in Moscow. They're auctioning his Nobel Peace Prize medal to raise money to help Ukrainian refugees. Um, So we have a lot of brave Russians who are putting their lives on the line, who are making great sacrifices to help Ukraine. Unfortunately, they are in the minority. 
the majority of Russians support Putin. The majority of Russians support Putin's war. And it's extremely important for us to shine a light on that and understand why. A lot of that stems from their history. What the Russians see as the great empire, the Soviet Union, um, the czarist empire, the captive nations like Ukraine, the Baltic states and others that suffered under Russian imperialism, see that as genocide, see that as terrorism, see that as enduring trauma. So this imperialist mindset that gives a lot of national pride, chauvinistic pride to the majority of Russians, that is something that has to be confronted and unraveled. Just like in the United States, we're confronting the Confederacy and the neo-Confederacy and the tiki torch wielding white boys who surround a statue of a brutal slave owner, General uh, Lee, right, in, in Charlottesville. So just like we put a light and, and name and shame Trump's fascist, American nationalist, American first neo-Nazi movement and all of their donors and all of the legal structures that empower them and allow them to steamroll over election protections, to steal elections, attempt to steal elections and come to power, just like you would not have any sympathy for the Trump mob that tried to violently overthrow our democracy, don't have any sympathy for the Russian fascists who are propping up Putin right now, because all of the work that we do in in dictatorships and how they work, dictators rely on a base. Every single dictator has had a base of supporters. They are necessary. Without that base of supporters, the dictator is dragged out and killed. So one of the many things protecting Putin right now is his base of supporters. They exist, they are real, and you are not helping at all the brave Russians risking their lives by ignoring that and refusing to shine a light on it and understand it. So when all these years we've been talking about dictatorship and how it works, now it would be very useful. And, and, and as part of that, as part of that discussion, we're always pointing to Hitler and the rise of Hitler and how Hitler was empowered and how so many that were complicit in that, all these people that tried to use him to come to power, the propaganda, all of it, of how it works, how a dictator comes to power. Now, what would be most useful is for us to understand what happened after the war. What happened to all those Germans that supported Hitler and pretended not to? What happened during the Nuremberg trials? How did the Nuremberg trials come together? And what about the Nuremberg defense where people said they're just following orders? How do you protect the world from the next Putin? Because I promise you, once Putin's gone, there's going to be another fascist to replace him. Just like when Trump's gone, there's going to be another Trumpist to replace him. You need to systemically get the rot out by the root. And you have to understand how it works, why they're doing it, why they're motivated to do it. And there needs to be international pressure on that system in order to break it from the core. And that has to include Nuremberg trials for the Russians that are carrying out war crimes in Ukraine and also for Syria, and all of these Russian soldiers that are willfully shooting missiles at schools and hospitals and shooting civilians point blank, they need to be personally sanctioned. Their families need to be personally sanctioned. They need to be kept in Russia and unable to travel to anywhere in in Europe and North America and elsewhere that cares about democracy and human rights. There has to be thousands and thousands and thousands of people on the on the sanction list for carrying out these war crimes, because it's not just Putin pulling the trigger. Yes, we acknowledge that a lot of Russians are deserting. Ukraine has been very clear that if they desert, they will be given money. They'll be given safety. They'll be treated humanely. Some are taking Zelensky up on this offer. Why aren't more doing it? Why are more choosing instead to deliberately mass murder civilians? That is a question we're going to be living with and must find the answers to in the years ahead. We must bring those people to justice because if we don't, another Putin will take his place and we'll be stuck fighting these same wars and dealing with these same mass casualties and mass refugee crises. The fascism in Russia is real. Don't try to sugarcoat it, Americans. I know Americans like to be Disney-esque and touchy, Mm -hmm. feel good and feel like, oh, but look at the brave Russians. The brave Russians exist. They're fearless, they're models for the rest of us, but their lives are in danger because of the fascists that are propping up the dictator at home. Their lives are not safe, their families are not safe until we pull fascism out by the root in Russia, in the US, wherever it is. 
Sarah and I are running a really important series this spring, looking at American fascism and how it works and what we can do about it. We're shining a light on all the many different tools and techniques and, and impulses of fascism here in America. A series like that needs to be created just for Russia, because all of us need to be prepared on how to hold those Russian war criminals accountable, not just for the safety of Ukraine and the rest of the world, but the safety for Russians themselves, so they can get back to their country, have a strong, safe democracy. Russian reformers and activists can stop worrying about their parents, and they can live at home again, and they can breathe free Russian air again. And all those kids, Russian kids on TikTok, who are risking their lives to go out and read the Russian constitution in the street and then getting manhandled by riot cops, they should be allowed to pursue whatever future they want inside Russia. And right now, they're being deprived of that because of the, the massive base of support of fascists, full-blown fascists that Putin currently enjoys that's helping prop them up, all right? That's a big discussion we're going to continue on the show. Now we're going to go to an interview about how the West can do more to protect civilians in Ukraine from Putin's war crimes. All right, so I'm joined by Elena Tregub. Since 2017, Elena is a Secretary General of NACO, N-A-K-O, the Independent Defense Anti-Corruption Committee, an international oversight body created by Transparency International. NACO's mission is to strengthen democratic oversight over defense spending, increase accountability and transparency of the sector. From 2015 to 2017, Elena led the National Authority for International Development Assistance coordination as the director at Ukraine's Ministry of Economic Development. She oversaw a vast portfolio of international development projects and programs totaling $12 billion. After a sharp increase of aid funds after Euromaidan, known as the Revolution of Dignity, she was responsible for establishing the assistance coordination mechanisms aimed at optimizing the involvement of international partners and aligning aid with national reform priorities. She worked on ensuring the efficient and transparent use of funds and public access to aid information by creating an online aid management system, openaid.gov.ua. So simply put, Elena is one of the superstars of Ukraine's civil society movement. She was very active on Euromaidan, and she was one of the many reformers that came into government um, following the revolution. And now with her unique perspective of oversight over Ukraine's defense industry, including corruption and, and lack of efficiencies and so forth, Elena is in, a, in an interesting role where she could see what the Ukrainian military has in its resistance against what we all considered to be the second most powerful military in the world, the Russian military that's ongoing in its genocidal war against Ukraine. And also she knows what Ukraine needs and what Ukraine's government and supporters are asking for it in order to successfully defeat Russia militarily because it doesn't seem like anything else will, short of Putin falling sick and dying or meeting an untimely end, it doesn't seem like anything else will really stop Putin at this point because the sanctions take forever to really kick in and he doesn't care about the people suffering. And he's just on this rabid quest to destroy Ukraine because the man is convinced of his own conspiracy theories about Ukraine and, and speaks about Ukraine in terms of genocidal language. So this might have to get resolved on the battlefield, unfortunately. So Elena is in a unique position to tell us what Ukraine has militarily, what it still needs, and how uh, the West can do more to support in resisting Putin. Welcome to Gaslight Nation, Elena. Hi, thank you for inviting me. What support has Ukraine received from the U.S. so far? And what are your thoughts about President Biden's support for Ukraine? Well, you know, initially, of course, uh, we are grateful that the United States uh, was able to warn the world about uh, the plans of Vladimir Putin to invade Ukraine, that everybody from the Western coalition of democracies, everybody was a little bit at least prepared for what's going to happen, at least on a mental level. So this is good that, uh, that there is this anti-Putin coalition that was formed. But at the same time, when it comes to practical uh, assistance, practical support uh, for Ukraine to be able to 
fight off uh, Russian aggression. Uh, I would say it's uh, too little and too late uh, what we are receiving, uh, catastrophically too little and too late. And I can explain, uh, for example, in terms of uh, military assistance, it's the most important thing right now because, uh, you know, it will determine uh, how much of the territory Putin uh, will be able to occupy. It will determine whether Putin will be able to take Kiev or not. Unfortunately, Ukraine uh, has not received this assistance from the United States. The, what we received uh, is some uh, fragment of uh, assistance, uh, some small tactical weapons, um, but they are absolutely not sufficient given uh, how many different weapons uh, Russians have and they are using against us. They are using strategic uh, ballistic missiles, uh, cruise missiles, supersonic missile, uh, they are thermobaric uh, bombs, and we just received basically the most uh, advanced uh, weapons we received from U.S. are uh, stingers and uh, javelins, you know, and uh, several helicopters. Uh, it's, of course, nothing comparing to uh, what we need. And our army currently is not equipped. Uh, we're running out of uh, our weapons. We do need more javelins. We don't have enough javelins. We need these bigger weapons even more urgently right now. So we need both. We need also urgently uh, support of United States to help us uh, buy from other countries or transfer from other countries that have Soviet uh, weapons because uh, we need tanks, armed vehicles, um, ammunition and, uh, uh, you know, artillery. And this, uh, we're just running out of everything just because our defense industry, which actually my organization was uh, uh, reforming and overseeing, it's not uh, prepared for this war. It was not really uh, preparing for the full-scale war. And currently, the uh, majority of the factories, uh, they don't even uh, function. And we cannot produce uh, urgently all these uh, weapons that we need. So the situation is critical. The situation is dire and we need uh, assistance immediately. Why are Soviet weapons important for Ukraine? This is because we need uh, them today and we need to start operating them today because uh, our uh, military knows how to use them. And uh, they will be able to do it immediately once we receive those uh, weapons. You know, for example, when we receive uh, like a javelin, uh, the instruction is written in English. It takes some time to uh, a military person to learn how to use a javelin. Not uh, many were trained how to use a javelin, just some. So, of course, uh, in, in this situation... Uh, we, we need uh, weapons that we already know very well how to use because right now uh, we have uh, maybe like, you know, several days before Russia will start their second uh, wave of escalation. Maybe we have several weeks. We don't know, but there is a feeling of urgency. We don't know if Belarus is going to formally put uh, boots on the ground tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. We need to be prepared for this. And once, you know, there is uh, uh, some maybe ceasefire in this war, maybe there is uh, some time, then we need more modern weapons. Then we need uh, those uh, serious weapons like Patriot uh, uh, long-range uh, air defense systems that we were asking for even before the beginning of this war. Uh, we need uh, serious uh, drones that can, uh, you know, destroy uh, the Russian uh, columns. Um, we, we need all of that, but we will need time to learn how. We'll, we need modern uh, jets. Right now, for example, we're asking for Soviet uh, jets like uh, MiGs, like uh, SU, but the pilot can learn how to fly a modern jet within one month several months and they can do it but at this stage of the war the soviet uh, equipment is what's needed urgently the most right now what do you say to uh, anyone who would point out that well look how great ukraine is doing with the javelins and stingers and helicopters we've already given them so why don't we just keep throwing more of those at ukraine 
you know, this is just uh, PR. This is just uh, a distortion of reality in uh, communication, uh, in public communication, because, uh, yes, there, there are a lot of stories covering how we're using uh, javelins, and, uh, uh, but uh, you should analyze uh, how many javelins we received and uh, how many of them we're using. Actually, we're not even uh, using all of them, I can tell you. And uh, we're using uh, much more of our own, for example, tanks, our own artillery systems, much more than javelins. But it's not reported in Western media because it's not as, you know, pleasant to hear maybe for American uh, taxpayers who are happy that Javelin is helping us. Yes, Javelin is helping us, but uh, Javelin will not help us to win war against Russia because it's not uh, the most uh, serious uh, weapon. And yet, you know, Javelin is a lethal weapon. And we don't understand why, for example, Biden administration thinks it's okay to give us Javelins, but it's not okay to give us jets. You know, uh, both are lethal uh, weapons, essentially. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, what needs to happen is that uh, Ukraine, we have right to ask for what we need and we need to be listened to. If, if Ukrainians are asking for those MiGs, for example, they should be given those MiGs because Ukrainians know what they need, you know. But currently the situation is that uh, we are given what we are given and we, should, we are thank- thankful for what we get. But, you know, it will not allow the Ukrainian armed forces to protect our civilians. Uh, Our civilians will keep dying from bombing, from cruising ballistic missiles. We don't have capacity to protect uh, lives. We, We don't. And also Ukrainian armed forces, they don't have capacity to completely stop uh, Russian advances on the ground. This is their reality. And, uh, you know, somehow I don't understand why you know, there is this optimistic uh, mood in the West because we were able to repel Russian aggression for th- uh, 25 days. But it's not a, a victory. We are very, very far from victory. We need, without assistance uh, from uh, uh, NATO, from US, uh, we will not be able to have any victory. What would you say to the concern that if the Biden administration gives jets to Ukraine, or if NATO gives Patriot missiles to Ukraine, that this could be seen as a direct provocation of Russia and therefore lead to World War III and nuclear war with Russia. I just want to remind to those who make this argument that Vladimir Putin does not need to be provoked to make a decision about aggression. For example, his current uh, war of aggression against Ukraine is completely unprovoked by anything. He just uh, decided to have this war because he can and because he calculated there will be no consequences for him. Because when he uh, annexed uh, Crimea, when he started war in the East, there were no consequences for him. So he decided now he can go further and he can be even more aggressive. This is the way his... uh, mind works. Uh, Vladimir Putin has zero uh, self-deterrence and he is always aggressive. It doesn't matter you provoke him or not. Vice versa, if he, if he sees weakness, this is when he has a, a aggression and this is when he moves further. So in my opinion, what the U.S. administration is currently doing, they are creating even more danger for Europe, for Western world. Because, you know, if Vladimir Putin uh, occupies... Um, For example, if they uh, make a calculation that it's okay that Vladimir Putin can occupy half of Ukraine and uh, he will, and it will be contained, this this war will not spread further. No, of course it will, because Vladimir Putin will create a you know a military base for him uh, in in that part of Ukraine. Uh, He will uh, just use it to start a bigger war. Because Ukraine is just uh, an intermediary stop for him. And uh, as you know, Russian even opinion polls show that majority of Russians want want uh, their government to attack a European uh, NATO country. They speak about it openly. It's a public demand. And Vladimir Putin will do whatever is needed in order for him to preserve his power because he's uh, desperately afraid to be... Uh, 
you know, imprisoned or executed for his multiple uh, crimes and his corruption. So he, whatever he does, he does it just for him. He wants to stay in power. And if staying in power means going to attack NATO country, of course he, he will do it. And, you know, moreover, if uh, the argument of uh, NATO countries and of Biden administration is that uh, giving us jets can uh, create provocation that Putin will uh, decide to, what, attack NATO for that, but it will be Putin's decision. And Putin, uh, so far, he has not yet, he will not uh, decide to attack NATO based on that. He will decide to attack NATO when he would calculate that it is... uh, safe for him to attack NATO. For example, uh, his calculation would be that uh, he will use asymmetrical warfare against NATO, even though NATO is 10 times stronger than Putin. He will just say, I'm going to use nuclear force. If you don't give me, for example, Estonia, and then there will be pundits on American uh, television, right, saying that, uh, okay, why would we risk in America our lives for Estonia? Let's just give him Estonia. Let's just exit NATO. This is what Putin wants. But uh, And it's very sad that so far uh, Biden's administration is uh, playing uh, along his uh, playbook, unfortunately. It's very wrong that uh, uh, Biden administration makes statements that we will not use boots on the ground. There is no way we will implement no-fly zone. Uh, no way we will give mix. Uh, because when they say uh, this, uh, they give Putin green light for more aggression and more escalation. And this is what is happening. You see, even though uh, Biden administration restrained themselves, they had very limited uh, assistance for Ukraine, nothing really big. Still, what are we seeing? We think that Putin is escalating every day. At this point, they are just destroying whole villages. They are just um, attacking uh, residential buildings, uh, you know, without any uh, consideration for human life. Uh, You know, they are shelling near nuclear power stations. Uh, They are sending more powerful missiles. Why is this escalation happening? You know, if uh, then uh, if he uses chemical weapons in Ukraine, if he if he uses even nuclear weapons, uh, will then Biden administration say no? We will not uh, intervene even if Putin uh, will use chemical weapons in Ukrainians. That's pretty much what already the White House uh, said. I think this is very wrong, and it just encourages an in- escalation on the behalf of Putin. Yeah, and I, and I think that pride and restraint that. The U.S. is showing that Biden is showing is a counter to George W. Bush and his administration, which quickly drove Americans into war based on lies that unleashed a big trauma for the U.S. That's been lasting with the forever wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. So when Biden shows his pride and restraint on this matter, it's coming from George W. Bush and what he did. It's something that Americans do want to hear and and they, they are comforted by. But obviously, the other side of this is to Putin, that restraint is translated in his mind as weakness and an invitation to keep going. So that's the whole enduring trauma of of Bush's wars here is that it's forced Americans into a position, essentially, that is just going to invite greater aggression from Putin. And I want to point out three of Russia's main polling firms. Uh, the three main polling firms in Russia that are considered objective and credible, every single one of them have polled Russians and seen that Putin's approval rating has never been higher. It's at 71 percent now because of his invasion of Ukraine. So this is something that Putin is glorifying in to excite the Russian people. He's created all sorts of disinformation to justify the sanctions and the international boycott, even his propaganda machine, even claiming there'll be reparations for what the West is doing to Russians in terms of all these sanctions. So Putin has never been more popular than he is right now among Russians. Where is that coming from? Because I know we in the West point out all the heroic Russians that are getting arrested for protests, but those are the minority the majority of Russians support Putin and his war and what he's doing. And yes, they live in a totalitarian state now, 
But for the last eight years since this invasion started, Russians had access to credible, objective information through all sorts of foreign sources on the internet. And they, they could have sought out alternative viewpoints and a lot of books on history, a lot of facts. They had Memorial, who was trying to show Russians all the atrocities committed under Stalin and so forth. So Russians that support Putin, they had other options all this time to get credible information, but yet they chose to fall in line with Putin's aggression and terrorism. So could you speak a little bit about where do you think that comes from among Russians and what do you think will happen between Russians and Ukrainians moving forward? Do you think this is going to be a conflict that endures for generations? Yeah, sure. But before I speak about that, I just wanted to briefly address your earlier argument that Americans are afraid of the uh, war of choice, uh, of this uh, Third World War threat. Uh, There is a huge uh, spectrum of things that can be done between doing nothing and going into the Third World War. There are many, many things how Ukraine can receive help without Americans going into the Third World War. And right now, Biden administration is doing the minimum, unfortunately. I don't speak about uh, sanctions. I speak about concrete, you know, rescue of uh, civilian life, uh, of a country that is fighting for democracy, for, you know, foundation of liberty, all the values that uh, we all share in our community of democracy. So they are doing too little. And this is why our argument is definitely we don't ask Americans to go to the Third World War, but just doing uh, much, much more is possible and it's not uh, risky as it is uh, portrayed uh, in American uh, media sometimes. And um, my answer to the second question is, yes, of course, uh, this war is not about Putin. Uh, Putin is just a leader of Russia who happens to be a leader of Russia, who happens to be corrupt and too scared to step down and he will do whatever is needed to stay in power and what is needed to stay in power is waging wars. Uh, Russia is a fascist uh, society by now. It's uh, very militaristic. Uh, They derive their pride from invading uh, other countries, from, uh, you know, hurting uh, other people. Unfortunately, this is how uh, right now the Russian culture is built that they see themselves as uh, some uh, nation who is entitled to suppress all other nations around them. And uh, the future of Russia is that it should be uh, deputinized, demilitarized, uh, it should be stripped of nuclear power. And only then, maybe in, uh, you know, 50 years from now, it can become a normal, uh, democratic, relatively democratic country. Because otherwise... Uh, Russia, if Russia stays the way it is, there will be another leader of the Putin who will uh, want to wage another war in uh, five or seven years from now. You know, it's just unfortunately the state that uh, Russia has become. And unfortunately, the world um, has not uh, really paid attention to what's uh, happening uh, with Russian society, Russian rhetoric. I just don't understand it. Russia has always been a huge, huge threat for the Western world, for the world order, but it it was completely ignored because, you know, Russia was able to corrupt uh, Western elites. Russia uh, had money to spread their Russia today propaganda all over the world. And, you know, uh, but Russians at the same time, um, there was no reaction when uh, for many years now on Russian TV, they were all saying how they dream about sending... uh, you know, nuclear weapons to uh, nuke, for example, Warsaw, to uh, nuke uh, Baltic states. It's their, like, national dream. And they have huge support for this uh, horrific, for horrific, you know, inhumane threats. It tells you uh, what culture currently this country has. And we see right now that, you know, uh, all these uh, 200 uh, troops, uh, which now are being sent to... Ukraine currently, you know, already many died, but currently there are 100, uh, around 100,000 troops in Ukrainian territory. They are not Putins. They are people who uh, think it's okay to fight this war, who think it's okay to fight Ukrainians, to kill Ukrainians. Uh, to erase uh, Ukraine from the face of the earth. It's unfortunately the ideology, the culture of this country. The world should deal seriously with this global threat. It's a much bigger threat than 
some terrorist organization because terrorist organizations, they emerge, then they dissolve and uh, uh, Russia is there. It's a big country, it exists and it will always be a threat and unless there is some uh, huge change, like I said, of, of the regime, of ideology, like it happened to Nazi Germany. What would you say to people in the West who have great sympathy for the Russian people and say, well, they're victims, they're brainwashed, those polls can't be trusted, even though they're by credible polling agencies because the Russians live in fear and they're staying home and remaining silent because they're scared. What would you say to that? Well, it's exactly the same as saying that, you know, Germans uh, who lived uh, under Adolf Hitler, they were also victims and they were afraid to speak against uh, Nazism. It's the same. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Russians, uh, they had uh, many, many chances to speak against Putin, to speak against this war. Uh, but uh, it's their choice. They, they made a choice not to speak against it. And uh, currently, yes, it's becoming increasingly hard for them to speak out because the laws are... Uh, now becoming more totalitarian, indeed. Uh, but, uh, you know, even if uh, when this uh, soldier uh, that we capture in Ukraine, he tells us uh, that he did not want to go to war, but he still went because what choice he had. He said, if I would refuse to go to war, I can go to jail. Well, it's a choice. He should have chosen jail, but he decided to go to kill innocent women and children. You know, unfortunately, this is the choice and they always have choice. So what would you like to see from the U.S. in terms of support to successfully defeat Russia? Well, I think that U.S. should just use its political, military, financial power that they have in the world to help Ukraine repel Russian aggression to help Ukraine maintain the territory that we currently have. And it needs to be done not as slow and in a delayed fashion as it is done now, but in a more proactive way, not reactive way, that Putin is ahead always and U.S. is behind. So, um, yes, uh, we need uh, help. uh, Like I said, that we receive the Soviet equipment. U.S. can help here because U.S. is the richest country out of all our uh, allies. And uh, U.S. gave us this uh, big, generous package of uh, money that we can use for military assistance, but we're not uh, really using this money properly right now. Uh, we, we can pay uh, to those uh, Eastern European countries so they can buy some replacement weapons so they are not uh, left defenseless. So this is urgent. And also, like I said, sending us more um, modern weapons on a later stage. Also tightening sanctions is very important. Unfortunately, the big problem is that, you know, that... Uh, during this war, uh, Germany paid to Russia probably uh, 4 billion euros for oil and gas, uh, which is financing directly the war. So if U.S. can help Europe to get rid of dependency on uh, Russian uh, oil and gas, this would be really big because Russia should be sanctioned and should be left without money completely to the extent that official in Russia cannot open a computer because this computer doesn't have Microsoft functioning, doesn't have any other programs. That They are completely unable to conduct this. What they are unable right now, Russian uh, factory is manufacturing cruise and ballistic missiles around the clock because they are running off low on uh, missiles because they fired already more than 1,000 uh, missiles uh, on Ukraine. And they make more of them. So U.S. should help us to the extent that Russia doesn't have, you know, materials, doesn't have capacity to make more uh, missiles. Otherwise, uh, it just will be too tragic, not only for Ukraine, but for Europe. Uh, You see, these uh, threats, they are huge because uh, Vladimir Putin, he really wants to destabilize NATO and Europe. He wants Ukrainian refugees to be more than 8 million, which is currently projected by European governments. He wants tens of millions of refugees. He wants to destroy basically Europe in order to control Europe or part of Europe. That's his goal, really. 
And U.S. should uh, see this and, and prevent this from happening because it will be major uh, catastrophe. Moreover, all these uh, bad regimes are looking right now what Putin is doing, threatening the world with nuclear weapons, and that he's able to get away with anything, basically, only because him threatening uh, U.S. with nuclear weapons. So if Biden administration doesn't change policy, what will happen? There will be massive nuclear proliferation of very bad actors after this war. The whole world can, you know, uh, become like chaotic and violent, essentially. And it all depends on the right policy that currently our Western partners should, uh, you know, implement. That's my message. Our discussion continues and you can get access to that by signing up on our Patreon at the truth teller level or higher. We want to encourage you to donate to your local food bank, which is experiencing a spike in demand. We also encourage you to donate to Oil Change International, an advocacy group supported with a generous donation from the Greta Thunberg Foundation that exposes the true costs of fossil fuels and facilitates the ongoing transition to clean energy. We encourage you to help support Ukraine by donating to Razum for Ukraine at Razum, R-A-Z-O-M, Razum for Ukraine.org. We also encourage you to donate to the International Rescue Committee, a humanitarian relief organization helping refugees from Ukraine, Syria, and Afghanistan. Donate at rescue.org. And if you want to help critically endangered orangutans already under pressure from the palm oil industry, donate to the Orangutan Project at theorangutanproject.org. Gaslit Nation is produced by Sarah Kenzier and Andrea Chalupa. If you like what we do, leave us a review on iTunes. It helps us reach more listeners. And check out our Patreon. It keeps us going. Our production managers are Nicholas Torres and Carlin Daigle. Our episodes are edited by Nicholas Torres, and our Patreon-exclusive content is edited by Carlin Daigle. Original music in Gaslit Nation is produced by David Whitehead, Martin Bissenberg, Nick Barr, Damian Ariaga, and Carlin Daigle. Our logo design was donated to us by Hamish Smith of the New York-based firm Order. Thank you so much, Hamish. Gaslit Nation would like to thank our supporters at the producer level on Patreon and higher. Eric Coffin. Jess Sauer. Chick Quinn. Lily Wachowski. Megan McNerney. Sean Rubin. Todd S. Perlstein. Pat. Kenny Main. John Schoenthaler. Frank Jaquette. Ellen McGirt. Joel Ferran. Larry Gasson. Larry Gasson. <laughs> I don't know why I did it. Erica Moore. <laughs> We're really tired. Karen A. Deal. Nico Phillips. Brian E. Castor. Andrea or Andrea Scalzo. <laughs> it's Andrea, dude. I'm almost positive. We, we need a bet on that one. Karen Heisler. Jordan Sanders. Ann Bertino. Chris Bravo. T.R. Dunstan. John Millet or Millet. David East. Stu, Shannon Nacy, Ida, Chris Fellow, Ben Wheaton, Joseph Mara Jr., Rich Holcomb, Thomas Scheibe, Kelsey Malsom, Julie Matthews, Meganopolis, Mark Mark, Barbara Kittridge, Matthew Womack, Silas Frank, Sean Berg, Kristen Custer, Tracy Ash, Benjamin Galuza, Kai Gillis, Sharon Hattrick, Irv Robinson, William Barry Reeves, Richard Smith, Emmy, Kevin Gannon, Yvonne Q, Mike Christensen, Sandra Collins, Katie Masuris, John Laughlin, Jeff Thompson, James D. Leonard, Leo Chalupa, Carol Golstad, Michael Woldridge, Kramer, no Kramer, <laughs> Jason Benke, Joe Darcy. Anne Marshall, Jeremy Lewis, Joel Newman, Trigbe, Christine M, T.L. Singfield, Matt Perez, Nicole Spear, Brian Tejudin, Maureen Murphy, Michelle Dash, Abby Road, <laughs> Jens Alstrup Rasmussen, Victoria Olson, Alabama, Z.W., Lisa LaFlame, Jason Bainbridge, Sarah Gray, Mike Tripico, Diana Gallagher, Jennifer Ann Luter, John Ripley, Ethan Mann, Pierre Itzma, David Porter, 
Kate Cotton. Kim Mellon. Leah Campbell. Lynn Schneider. Jared Lombardo. Karen Humphreys. Eric Kaplan. Tanya Chalupa, who <gasps> deserves Any probably relation? the most credit because she gave me life and therefore the show was able to happen. Yes. So thank you all for your support of the show. We could not make Gaslit Nation without you. Thank you. Thank you.